In what has been described as a Neanderthal Pompeii, around 350,000 years ago, an extraordinary event occurred in southern Italy. Early Neanderthals climbed the slopes of the active Rocca Monfigna volcano shortly after its eruption. Archaeologists discovered fossilized footprints preserved in layers of ash, tracing these early humans' movements across the hazardous landscape. These footprints, known as the Ciampate del Diavolo, the Devil's Trail, provide unique insight into the Neanderthals' boldness, intelligence, and survival strategies. This is fascinating because of the many unanswered questions regarding the behavior of our ancient brothers and sisters. The Rocamonfina volcano has an elevation of 1,066 meters, about 3,500 feet. This now extinct volcano was active during the Pleistocene era, sculpting the landscape with lava flows, pyroclastic deposits, and caldera formations. Around this time, Neanderthals had recently evolved from a more ancient ancestor who had lived in Eurasia many hundreds of thousands of years, so they were well adapted to the European environment. These pre-contact Neanderthals were more primitive or archaic than later Neanderthals, as they went through an evolutionary process just as our own subspecies. Rocca Monfina Volcano, situated in the modern-day Campania region, was a volatile environment. After a violent eruption, the slopes were covered in ash and pumice, making the area unstable and dangerous. The fact that Neanderthals traversed this still-smoking terrain suggests that they were familiar with volcanoes and had the intelligence to deal with unpredictable natural forces. Indeed, the footprints are thought to have been left shortly after an eruption, when the ash was still soft enough to capture the foot impressions in full detail. The discovery indicates the presence of at least three people moving cautiously but purposefully uphill, as if to survey the newly transformed landscape. The fossilized tracks are a unique intimate record of these early humans' movements and decisions in real time. During this time, the Earth was in a short warm period, with a climate nearly as warm as today. The prints, which range in length from 20 to 29 centimetres, or 8 to 12 inches, show evidence of deliberate motion. Some steps appear to indicate slipping or adjusting to unsteady ground, while others maintain a steady gait. This combination of caution and persistence suggests that these Neanderthals were not fleeing in panic, but rather actively exploring the area. According to the size and shape of the prints, researchers believe the group included both adults and younger Neanderthals. This discovery suggests that Neanderthals were willing to bring younger members along, even into dangerous situations, demonstrating the importance of learning and observation in their social structure. The fossilized Neanderthal footprints discovered on the Rocamonfina volcano include at least three sets of prints. These prints ascend a steep slope, with signs of slipping and careful adjustments to maintain balance, indicating that the terrain was unstable as a result of recent volcanic activity. The footprints point uphill, indicating that the group was moving towards a vantage point. As mentioned, the footprints reveal deliberate measured steps, indicating that they were cautiously and purposefully navigating the hazardous, ash-covered landscape. Nevertheless, the footprints are more than just the remains of a long-forgotten journey. They provide a glimpse into the lives of early Neanderthals, revealing their intelligence, bravery and adaptability. They remind us that these early humans navigated complex environments, faced dangers head-on, and made deliberate decisions in the same way that we do today. What's more, the Soprano skull, found at a nearby archaeological site, also dating back to around 350,000 years, may represent these early Neanderthals. The skull has several injuries. The first is a deep, wide recess infiltrating the left greater wing of the sphenotemporal suture on the sphenoidal sinus, which was discovered early in Soprano's literature history. Second, there's a healed depression in the right brow. This was most likely caused by an altercation with a large animal in which the skull was butted and fractured. This is more plausible than another, more popular explanation that the blow was delivered by another Neanderthal wielding a wooden club. Investigators hypothesized that the individual was a young adult Neanderthal male who hunted for himself or the group and was bold and aggressive based on the number of injuries. The fracture healed, 
indicating that it did not result in death, and the malformation on the skull was neither restrictive nor painful enough to limit the Neanderthal man's physical abilities. The colour of early Neanderthal's pigmentation and eyes is another interesting topic of debate. According to peer-reviewed study in the journal Science, one female Neanderthal from Croatia, for example, had seven genes for brown eyes, one for not brown eyes, three for blue eyes, and four for not blue eyes. This suggests they inherited these traits from the last common ancestor around 500,000 years ago. The Soprano archaeological site is located in an area that has experienced both fluvial and volcanic activity, which may have had an impact on human and animal life in the region. Geological studies indicate that volcanic ash from nearby volcanic systems, including the Roccamonfina volcano, was deposited in the surrounding area. These two sites, taken together, demonstrate early humans' resilience in navigating dangerous environments. While the Neanderthals explored fresh volcanic ash at Roccamonfina, the Caprano individual represents the evolutionary transition and diversity of these humans facing challenges during the Middle Pleistocene. The purpose of the Neanderthals' ascent remains a source of debate. Possible reasons for the group's presence include scouting and exploration and surveying the aftermath of the eruption and seeking new resources. The volcanic ash may have driven prey animals out into the open, allowing the Neanderthals to hunt these creatures. Alternatively, the area may have provided valuable materials, such as sharp volcanic rocks for tools. It is also possible that the ascent had spiritual significance, though we can only speculate on what the volcano might have meant to the Neanderthals. Regardless of the reason, this journey demonstrates the Neanderthals' ability to adapt to harsh environments and take calculated risks, demonstrating that they were far more than scavengers or brutes. Whatever the case, the footprints provide compelling evidence of Neanderthals' cognitive abilities. To climb a dangerous volcano, you needed to understand the terrain, weather and safety, as well as the foresight to plan your route and manage risks. Their decision to explore so soon after the eruption demonstrates both a keen awareness of their surroundings and the ability to seize opportunities in difficult circumstances. These behaviours are consistent with broader archaeological evidence that Neanderthals possessed advanced tool-making skills, participated in symbolic activities such as burial practices, and likely used body adornments and pigments. The study of Roccamonfina suggests a curiosity and adaptability that are similar to behaviours seen in modern humans, further dismantling outdated stereotypes of Neanderthals as unintelligent or solely motivated by survival needs. The Neanderthals may have ventured up the mountain to obtain wood for spear-making, which can only be found at higher elevations. Crafting a seemingly simple wooden spear reveals a surprisingly sophisticated understanding of arboreal materials, engineering, and skill development in early humans. These spears, some of the oldest wooden hunting tools ever discovered, demonstrate not only advanced craftsmanship, but also a deep knowledge of the properties of wood and physics. Creating an effective spear begins with the careful selection of wood, which is no trivial task. The 400,000-year-old Schöningen spears from Germany were primarily made from spruce and pine, with some crafted from more resilient woods like yew. Knowing which type of tree to use and selecting the appropriate section requires generations of accumulated knowledge about which wood will balance strength, flexibility and weight. The spears made from yew, in particular, are very strong and good for throwing, and grows at higher elevations. Smaller but mature trees growing about the snow line would be ideal for making a spear shaft. Beyond wood selection, early Neanderthals had to master the process of straightening the shafts. Natural trees are rarely perfectly straight, so these early craftsmen likely employed heating techniques, such as steaming, to bend and shape the wood. The spear's tip needed to be sharpened to an ideal point, which involved not only skill with stone tools, but also an understanding of wood grain patterns to ensure the tip was durable enough to withstand impact. Furthermore, a well-crafted spear must be balanced for throwing. The Schoningen spears reveal this was no accident. Researchers have found that the tips of these spears are slightly off-center, a feature that would improve aerodynamic stability, much like a javelin today. 
This detail suggests early Neanderthals experimented with and understood how slight variations in design could enhance performance, something far from the stereotype of primitive tools being simple or poorly thought out. Just as children today develop coordination and physical prowess through sports, young Neanderthals likely honed their spear-throwing skills through practice from a young age. This would have involved trial and error learning, muscle memory development and peer guidance. Mastering the use of such a tool is not only about creating the spear, but also about developing the strength, aim and timing necessary to hunt effectively. Thus, the spear was both a technological artifact and a skill nurtured across generations. The Schoningen spears show us that early humans were not only tool makers, but also engineers and educators. Crafting a spear was the result of precise knowledge, ability and skill, passed down through generations, qualities we often associate with far more recent technological advances. Indeed, when comparing human intelligence to specific tasks like building a fire or making tools, studies show that these activities necessitate a combination of cognitive abilities, such as creativity, problem-solving and practical knowledge. Fire-making, for example, requires more than just striking a spark. It also requires an understanding of materials and the environment, which correlates with higher levels of planning and resourcefulness. According to research on wilderness survival, the ability to integrate complex information influences human decision-making in practical survival tasks, such as selecting tools or starting a fire. It requires creativity and an understanding of environmental factors, both of which are cognitive abilities related to general intelligence and problem-solving. Furthermore, practical intelligence, skills such as fire-building, reflects how humans use their cognitive abilities to solve specific problems in real-world situations. These studies indicate that humans who are skilled in specific survival skills, such as building a fire, are able to engage in other creative and problem-solving activities that require overlapping cognitive capacities. This suggests that proficiency in one practical skill is highly likely to correlate with abilities in other tasks that require similar cognitive functions. Fire-building and tool-making skills are both based on problem-solving, planning and practical knowledge. Both sets of activities necessitate fine motor skills, creativity and an understanding of materials, all of which are essential components of human intelligence. For example, making fire and tools necessitates the ability to plan ahead of time, adapt to changing conditions and comprehend material properties. Both tool-making and fire-making require spatial reasoning and the application of symbolic thinking. Prehistoric archaeology demonstrates that early humans engaged in these practical survival tasks. This suggests that the cognitive abilities required for practical tasks, such as fire-building, can easily be transferred to other tasks, such as spear-making. This demonstrates an ability to associate physical objects with abstract ideas, which is a key component of creativity. As discussed, crafting spears requires the technical ability to shape materials into a desired shape or form. Understanding how different materials behave when worked with, as well as patience and precision, are all necessary components of creative problem-solving. As we examine these prints, we have gained not only insight into their lives, but also a better understanding of the common origins of human behavior. The Neanderthals who left their footprints on the slopes of Rocamonfina volcano teach us that curiosity, exploration, and the ability to face uncertainty are not only characteristics of modern humanity, but have been part of our story for hundreds of thousands of years. Finally, according to another peer-reviewed study in the journal Science, human skin tone has varied for 900,000 years, and some ancestral light skin gene variants are shared between the African Bushmen and archaic hominins, such as Neanderthals and Denisovans, which suggests a shared common ancestry for this trait before the split of the three hominin lineages. And with that tantalizing statement, we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human history. And before you go, please share, comment and check out the other videos on our channel. Thank you and take care.